Today we're going to talk about gas exchange in aquatic insects. And aquatic insects, just like a lot of most insects, have a tracheal system. Um, they require oxygen because they um, go through metabolism. And in particular, to respire, they need to convert fuel into energy, and that takes oxygen. Insects are not good at anaerobic respiration. Some organisms are or have mechanisms to do that, um, to respire without in the present, to respire in the absence of oxygen, but insects don't do that well. So gas exchange is bringing oxygen into the body and moving carbon dioxide out of the body. And to do that in insects, we use, they use a tracheal system. Um, it's a system of air-filled tubes that are connected um, sometimes to the outside through a hole called a spiracle. Um, and the trachea then are the larger um, tubes that are connected to tracheoles, which are smaller tubes. And those tracheoles connect um, not directly, but they come very close to muscle tissue and organs and allow for diffusion across their membranes. The tracheal system is very efficient, so insects don't need to involve the circulatory system in oxygen transfer for the most part, although a few do. <clears throat> um, insects have what's called an open circulatory system, so they don't have veins that carry blood around their bodies. Um, instead, their blood, which is called hemolymph, um, is just in the body cavity, kind of loosely. Most insects do not use hemoglobin to carry oxygen around the circulatory system, but a few do. And we'll talk about that. And even aquatic insects have these air-filled tubes, these trachea and tracheoles that reflect their evolutionary history um, from coming from land, basically. So there are two types of tracheal systems. There's an open tracheal system where gas is exchanged directly as a gas um, from the atmosphere. So these organisms need to visit the surface of the water <clears throat> to fill, basically fill their tracheal system with air. Or they get their um, air directly from a bubble of air that they carry underwater with them. This is in contrast to a closed tracheal system where um, dissolved gas diffuses across the body's surface into the tracheal system. And these organisms then need to convert gases that are dissolved in the water to a gaseous state in the trachea. So here is an organism, a megalopterin, and these organisms are bimodal breathers. They can breathe in both ways simultaneously. So they bring some oxygen in um, <clears throat> through an open system and they bring other oxygen in through a closed system. Now diffusion um, of gas is reliant on the physical properties of gas. So if you've had physics or chemistry, you might've heard of Fick's law. Um, basically the, the rate of diffusion of a gas is proportional to the surface area over which, over which it is diffusing across and to the diffusion gradient. So the diffusion rate will be higher if the surface area is greater and if the difference between the, the concentrations of the gas at the two ends is larger. So if the diffusion gradient is more extreme. So high surface area to area, sorry, that's a spelling area. High surface area to volume ratios help diffusion. And so gills um, are helpful in terms of increasing surface area for gas transfer. Organisms with very low metabolic rates might, might be able to rely just on diffusion. Um, when a tissue takes up oxygen, the diffusion gradient increases because it gets lower next to the tissue because the oxygen is being taken up. And so because that diffusion gradient is now greater, more oxygen is drawn toward the surface. So that's a, it's a really nice kind of um, characteristic. The total amount of gas um, in say in water or in a, in a room basically, but we're talking about water for the most part, the total amount of gas is the sum of all the partial pressures of every constituent gas in the, in the mixture basically. So um, the potential for gases to diffuse between the air and the water is associated with these partial pressures. 
And things like CO2 is actually more soluble in water and it diffuses faster in water than oxygen. So organisms have to deal with different, different diffusion rates for these two different gases as they're trying to bring oxygen in and car push carbon dioxide out. They have different diffusion rates, so they have to deal with that. So here is um, here are just some images of the tracheal system. It varies somewhat between insects, among insects. Um, for the most part, branching patterns connect spiracles that are holes to the outside um, with muscles and organs on the inside. Um, there are generally in insects up to 10 pairs of spiracles, but often far fewer. Um, sometimes only two, sometimes none. Um, so some insects have no spiracles. They have a completely closed tracheal system and all of the oxygen enters their body through their membranes. Um, for some organisms, there are two large trachea that run down the length of the insect, kind of shown in this um, figure on the right. And there are also can be the, um, these large sacs as part of the tracheal system that are kind of storage organs for holding on to air. The spiracles um, are these openings and for terrestrial organisms they prevent water loss and so there's kind of a complex um, series of gates and doors that help help to keep um, the, the organism from losing a lot of water when it's dry. But for an aquatic insect, the bigger problem is keeping the water out, right, out of these holes. And so um, there are different hatches and atrial openings for um, some aquatic insects because of this. The tracheal tissue, so down at the very tiny branches that are getting close to muscle tissue, like shown in the bottom figure, um, is very thin. And so it's thin enough to allow diffusion of the gases into organs and muscles. So the connection um, between the tracheal and the muscle tissue, they, they don't like penetrate through the muscle tissue, but they're kind of, they're so close that diffusion occurs really easily. And the insects can kind of pump air through their bodies, throughout their tracheal system, using large muscle movements. So things like flying. Flying requires a lot of oxygen. And the process of flying actually pumps oxygen through their bodies. Um, odonates bring um, oxygen into their spiracles in the rear end, basically. And then they can push it out really fast. And that's one of the ways that they can uh, move through jet propulsion. So a little bit more detail about open tracheal systems. Um, air enters the body via these functional spiracles, these holes. Some of these organisms need to visit the surface to go get a bubble, kind of like the, the dytissid beetle it's shown on the um, right. And then they need to hold on to that air. So some organisms hold um, these bubbles below their wings, um, like dytissid beetles and some hemipterans. Some organisms hold um, bubbles using what are called hydrofuge hairs on their bodies, like elmid um, riffle beetles and other hemipterans. And some organisms use spiracular gills, so gills that are connected to the spiracle. And I'm gonna talk about them in a little bit more detail. But for instance, the Blepharoceridae um, fly larvae use spiracular gills. So these gas stores, these bubbles and things provide insects with extra buoyancy, which is helpful because a lot of insects with their hard exoskeletons are, not, are negatively buoyant. So these organisms, um, if you have an open tracheal system, um, some of them have complete dependence on atmospheric air. So like this mos these mosquito larvae, they have to go to the surface, they have to extend their spiracle up um, through the surface tension of the water and then expose it to air and draw air in. So they have to spend a lot of time at the surface of water and they need still, still water. And they need to be able to keep the water out of their spiracle. So sometimes there are hairs that kind of close over the spiracle. Um, it's also a challenge for them to overcome the surface tension of the water at the surface when they need to go up for air. So that's an additional challenge. 
Um, like I said, they might have water repellent spiracular features that help. These are called hydrofuge features. So things like oils that they secrete near their spiracle, um, hairs, they might be, just be really fast. You know, they can be, they can go up there and quickly grab their bubble or quickly fill their tracheal system. Um, sometimes they hang from the surface. So like you can see for these mosquito larvae, they can hang from the surface from a spray of hairs uh, around their spiracle. They can dangle from the surface and just take, take air in. Some really cool organisms, um, a lot of, uh, a few different types of fly and beetle larvae can actually use their spiracle as like a saw blade and they can saw into macrophytes, into emergent plants, either into their stems or into their roots, and they can tap into the arenchyma. So the figure on the very bottom, um, on the left, it shows you some macrophytes, some kind of cattail-like things extending out of the water. Well, underwater, either in their stem or in their root, they have, they have these large air-filled vessels, kind of pipes that transmit air um, down to their roots that need to respire. And these, um, this is a beetle, I think, larva um, that can, has a the spiracle is kind of shaped like a saw and it can saw into the root and tap into those arenchyma in the, the macrophyte. So they can, they have these root piercing spiracles and basically they're then using the macrophyte as a snorkel to access oxygen from the air. The other thing, oh, actually, I think this is actually, these are pictures not of a beetle, but of a mosquito larva, Cochilotidia perturbans. And they find these roots underwater by sensing carbon dioxide concentrations because the roots are respiring, they're letting off CO2. And so they can find the roots and then they can tap into the root um, for oxygen. 